Led Zeppelin's first album came crashing into the world in 1969, bringing with it a brand of rock music that would take over the world. Formed from the ashes of Jimmy Page's previous band, The Yardbirds, the band went through a few iterations before finally settling on the lineup of Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, John Bonham, and John Paul Jones. The first rehearsal took place on the 19th of August 1968, the day before Plant's 20th birthday, and shortly before a tour of Scandinavia, performing some old Yardbirds material, as well as some new songs such as Communication Breakdown, I Can't Quit You Baby, Baby I'm Gonna Leave You, and How Many More Times. The New Yardbirds was the name given to the band to represent the shift to the new lineup, but they were still playing under the name The Yardbirds to fulfill contractual obligations. They toured as The Yardbirds for about five to six weeks until it came time to change the name. The name came from a remark from The Who's John Entwistle to his bandmate Keith Moon, a possible contender for the new Jimmy Page band at the time. He said that the band would go down like a lead balloon. Lead was shortened to lead so as not to be confused with lead, and balloon with Zeppelin, the name given to the air balloons that included the Hindenburg that features on the front cover, crashing and burning. The group entered Olympic Studios at 11pm on the 25th of September 1968 to record their debut album. One of the reasons for the odd start time was that it was cheaper to book the studios outside of peak times and with Jimmy Page and Peter Grant footing the bill themselves without a record deal in place, it was a good idea to keep the cost down just in case. The majority of the songs on the album are originals, but there are covers also with two Willie Dixon songs, You Shook Me and I Can't Quit You Baby. Dazed and Confused was originally written by the folk rock singer Jake Holmes and released as a track on his debut album, The Above Ground Sound of Jake Holmes, in 1967. That same year, Jake Holmes opened for the Yardbirds at a show in New York where Jimmy Page heard the song. The Yardbirds at the time started playing it live with the original lyrics and then later on it was adopted by Led Zeppelin, rearranged with new lyrics by Plant. It became one of their best-known songs, but Jake Holmes didn't receive his dues until 2011, after suing the band the previous year. Jimmy Page's main guitar for the album was his 58 or 59 Fender Telecaster that became known as the Dragon. The guitar was originally purchased in 1961 by Josh Owen for £107. It featured a blonde finish with a rosewood fretboard and a top-loading bridge. Josh Owen was in a band called the Deltones, which featured another young guitarist named Jeff Beck. Beck later acquired it in a swap deal for his Burns Trisonic, and a few years after that, Beck gifted it to Jimmy Page for helping him to land a gig in the Yardbirds, replacing Eric Clapton. Originally, Eric had recommended Jimmy as his replacement, but Jimmy in turn recommended Beck, who got the gig, of course. The Telecaster was modified by Page in February of 1967, when he added eight round mirrors to the body. They were removed after a few months, when he decided to strip the original paint and repaint it himself. He also replaced the black pit guard with an acrylic one and added a diffraction film so that a spectrum of light would be seen when the light hit it. Jimmy said that he used the Telecaster for every song on the album except You Shook Me, which featured a Gibson Flying V. Somebody was trying to sell me a Gibson Flying V at the time. I don't know what made them think I could afford it, because I clearly couldn't. But I asked them if I could just try it out. I brought it into Olympic Studios and used it on You Shook Me. With those big humbuckers, it was so powerful, you can hear it breaking up the amp in the middle of the song. I could have tidied it up, but I really like hearing the amp struggle to get a sound out. It's really fighting through the electronics to get it out of the speaker. The acoustic guitar used on Baby I'm Gonna Leave You was another that wasn't his. Jimmy explained to Guitar Player magazine in 1977, that was a Gibson J200, which wasn't mine. I borrowed it. It was a beautiful guitar, really great. I've never found a guitar of that quality anywhere since. I could play so easily on it, get a really thick sound. It had heavy gauge strings on it, but it just didn't seem to feel like it. His main amplifier for the record was his Supro Coronado 1690T. He'd had the amp for a few years by the time of the recording of the first Zeppelin album, and it was heavily modified by then, after a repair. The amp had literally fallen out the back of a van while on tour, and the engineer that repaired it did so in a way that gave the amp a unique sound that Jimmy really loved. Using what was available in England at the time, instead of like-for-like -like American parts, the preamp tubes were changed to mullards, and the rectifier tube to a GZ34 and GE 6L6 power tubes. Jimmy's amp originally had two 10-inch speakers, but this was changed to a single 12-inch. It was an American speaker that had been reconed with the British one though. It's thought that he also used Vox amps as well on the album, as he did throughout his career. But there's little information that I can find on this, so if anyone knows anything about it, please feel free to leave something in the comments. For pedals, he had the Solar Sound Tone Bender Mark II for fuzz, a Maestro Echoplex EP2 for delays, and a grey Vox Wah. The Echoplex was used a lot for slapback style delay, 
to thicken double guitar parts in the studio. The other main use was the preamp of the EP2. It was used to push the front of the amps into natural overdrive by boosting the signal. It used the Vox Wah pretty much exclusively in the early days of the band, and these were modified by Roger Mayer to suit Page's needs. John Paul Jones was playing his 1962 Fender Jazz bass, lightly into an acoustic 360 bass head paired with a 361 cabinet. The type of strings he used has caused some debate over the years, with the man himself recalling that he ditched flat wounds for round wounds before his Led Zeppelin days, but due to the sound and his own admission in the past, he could have actually made the switch a few albums into his Zeppelin career. Of course, he wasn't just confined to the bass guitar. As the band's keyboard player, you can hear him playing his Hammond M100 on You Shook Me, and interestingly, although it sounds like it's been played through a rotating Leslie speaker, he's actually using the M100's built-in vibrato setting, and throughout the solo, he changes the vibrato chorus rate and depth, which creates a similar sound to the Leslie. Although known for using Ludwig drums throughout his career, John Bonham's drums to the first album was actually a Slingerland kit he inherited from the Yardbirds. The kit featured a 22-inch bass drum, a 14x5-inch snare, likely a Ludwig Superphonic, and 13 and 16-inch toms, while the colour is unknown, many people believe it's blue, or possibly a green sparkle kit. My attempt to colourise it with AI made it come up silver, which is a bit dubious. Undoubtedly, one of the most important aspects of the album's sound is the production ideals of Jimmy Page and Glyn Johns, with one happy accident giving birth to a drum recording technique named after Johns and still used to this day, the Glyn Johns method. Until this point, drum recording was always done in mono, at least in pop and rock recordings, with often even just two mics used, an overhead and a kick drum mic, and then later a snare drum mic was added. The story goes that during the recording of the album, a mic that had been used for an acoustic guitar was swung out of the way near the floor tom. The mic was open on the desk, and Bonham happened to start playing, and Glenn immediately liked what he heard, and a studio legend was born. This liking for ambience extended to guitar amp miking also, with Glenn and Jimmy preferring to use distance mics. For the cabs, along with the close mics, they also had one five to ten feet away as they firmly believed in a distance create size approach and wanted the recordings to sound big and spacious. They also liked to layer Jimmy's guitar parts with different sounds, including a layer with a straight amp sound and one with a pedal, and pan them to make them sound wide. Along with the Echoplex, Page was also fond of backwards plate reverb, where the tape is flipped over and a reverb recorded to an empty track while it's playing in reverse. Then when the tape is turned back over, the backwards reverb is heard, starting before the sound it was applied to. This can be heard a lot on the vocals for this album. Despite incredible performances and writing contributions all over the album, Robert Plant didn't originally receive any credit for his writing work and felt doubtful about his future in the band. Page said of his early work, Robert was supposed to change the lyrics to the blues numbers, and he didn't always do that, he said. They couldn't get us on the guitar parts of the music, but they nailed us for the lyrics, with Plant saying, as far as I was concerned, I thought I was going to leave the band. Recorded in just 30 hours of studio time, stretched over a three-week period, I know because I paid the bill, said Page. The album was released on the 13th of January 1969, well that was in the States at least. The UK had to wait another two months to get their copy. It's interesting to hear Glyn Johns raving about the album when working with the Beatles on the Get Back sessions. Oh, do you want to hear something this Jimmy Page album? Jimmy Page? Yeah. Just produced an album. It's new group. Is he the one that did it at the Aldo? Yeah. yeah. Oh, but it's really, that is such a good group. Just so tight. John Paul Jones, obviously. John Paul Jones, obviously. Don't you know him here? Jimmy Ayrton sessions. He's like the governor. He's very young, about 24. The governor bass player. Paul Finn? Really yeah. good. And a kid called John Bonham on drums. I think he was on a session with Paul, I think, with somebody else. Yeah. The reviews were poor initially, with Rolling Stone magazine saying that they have to find a producer, editor and some material worthy of their collective talents, calling Page a limited producer and criticising his writing skills. It also called Plant as foppish as Rod Stewart, but nowhere near as exciting. Because of the bad press, Led Zeppelin avoided talking to them throughout their career. Although the press reaction to the album wasn't entirely negative, in Britain, the album received a glowing review in Melody Maker, with Chris Welch writing a review titled Jimmy Page triumphs. Led Zeppelin is a gas. Also, the public's reaction to their live show saw the band growing in popularity, with the press and rock fans finally catching up to their uncompromising approach. Rolling Stone eventually changed their mind also, with the album ranked 29th on their 500 greatest albums of all time list, their highest charting album on that list. The album's raw explosive qualities continue to thrill listeners to this day. And for those that were there, it will always remind them of the first time they heard this incredible band. <laughs>